Thank you, Riley. Now, I got to tell you, this preaching to a camera is something that is going to take a lot of getting used to. Uh, and I'll be honest, I am more nervous with the room empty and just a camera than when there is a room full of people here to talk to. And so when I was thinking about this, I was preparing uh, this week, I got to thinking and I realized, you know, when I took Toastmasters, they gave us a lot of tips on uh, how to kind of get over some of the stage fright and some of the nervousness. And then there's the classic, imagine your uh, audience in their underwear. So I thought that this morning I would try to imagine the audience in their seats. Um, yeah. <laughs> I really, when I, when I speak, I really enjoy the uh, feedback from the audience. And as Logan pointed out last week, we're literally preaching to the choir here. So that's going to put a lot of stress on you six because uh, I need feedback. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Anyway, I will continue to uh, imagine that we have the audience in their seats, and occasionally if I tell a joke, uh, I will try to remember to imagine them laughing like they are now. All right, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we uh, come to you today. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, and we thank you for uh, the time you've given us to come together uh, even if it's only digitally, to come together and to, to worship you, Lord. And we thank you for your scripture. Lord, I just ask that you would be with me this morning. Uh, help this morning's message to be your message and not mine, Lord. I just pray that you would, uh, that you would speak through me at this time. And pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So last week, uh, Pastor Dennis talked about contentment and about how Contentment is key to our worshiping God. Now, some of you may then listen to today's sermon and think that the two of us sat down and coordinated. I promise you we didn't. Uh, I picked this passage out several weeks, uh, even before I was asked to preach. Uh, so when it's, if, if it's not good, you can know that it's not for lack of preparation. Uh, and... I did not know what Pastor Dennis was going to say last week until he said it. So there was no coordination between the two of us, I promise. But I am going to talk about the importance of being content with what God is doing in our lives and understanding where we are so that we can improve, so that we can grow our relationship with God. Now to kind of put some of this in context, uh, I... I did a little research, uh, and I got to thinking, because I, I, had, I had been thinking that, you know, Americans whine a lot. Honestly, we do. We complain about everything, and there's even a joke about a lot of the things that we complain about, right? They call it first world problems. Oh, my internet's not working. Yeah, that's a first world problem, right? Uh, so I did a little research, and I found out that the federal government... Uh, has set the poverty level in, the, in America at $24,000. So if you make less than $24,000 uh, in America, the government considers you as poor. Now, worldwide, if you make $50 a day or more, you are considered high income. So I sat down with a calculator and I figured out $50 times 365 days. That means if you make $18,250 a year or more on the global consideration, you are considered high income. Not middle class, not doing well, but high income. What that means is we have people in America who we consider poor who are high income in the rest of the world. I did a little more digging and I found some other statistics I found was interesting. If you adjust for uh, cost of living based on, you know, some places are more expensive. For example, here in Hawaii, uh, $24,000 is not hardly going to get you anything. Uh, but if you go to where I grew up, $24,000, you can live. 
Uh, but we look at, so it, when we adjust for those kind of things, we can look at some things. I found very interesting, with the adjusted comparisons, 56% of Americans on the global scale would be considered rich. 32% uh, would be considered upper middle class in the global scale. In other words, here in America, 88% of our population on, when compared to the rest of the world would be upper middle class or better. Leaving, of course, only 12% to be lower. And as we break it down, we find that only 2% in, in America would be considered poor outside of America. Of course, we can look around and we, c we understand that we consider those numbers to be higher. So what is the difference? Well, the difference is we here in America, we are blessed with things that we don't even recognize. So I did another Google search and I looked for things that people in America complain about. And I came up with a list of 16 things. Uh, I will read the list and I will read some of the comments that I read uh, concerning the list as we go through it. But uh, number one thing on the list of things that pe uh, people in America complain about, and obviously these are probably things we shouldn't, uh, is slow but free Wi-Fi. It's free, people. Yes. If so what if it's slow? It's free. Uh, lengthy waits at the drive throughs Now, especially right now during COVID, if you go to a drive through there's probably a lengthy wait because that's the only way you're dining out. Uh, but think about this for a moment. You're sitting in an air-conditioned car, listening to a bit of music as you drive up, and a hand pops out of a window and hands you your hot food, and you're on your way. If we stop and think about this, this is the kind of living that kings and queens of old got, and no one else. And yet we complain if it takes a few extra minutes. And hey... Most of the time, it's courteous. Sometimes you might have a rude person. Sometimes they might get your, your order wrong. If they get your order wrong, that's, you know, human mistake or Taco Bell. But for the most part, you get your food that you want. Hey, by the way, my imaginary crowd is laughing. You get your food that you want without having to put any effort into it. But we complain about the weight. Other things that we complain about... 40-hour jobs. Uh, this, of course, is especially mind-blowing consider uh, considering the alternatives, especially if you have one of those jobs where you Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, 8 to 4, and you're complaining about it. Uh, you know, the alternatives are you could be unemployed or you could be maybe working weekends or you could be maybe working 25 hours at a retail store and struggling to make ends meet. But yet we complain about our 40-hour jobs. We complain about the weather. A uh, le little less of that here in Hawaii than on the mainland, I'm sure. Uh, but people do complain about the weather. Uh, we complain about the arduous task of flying. Now, even from when I was a kid growing up to now, the mobility that is available to the average American because of air flight is amazing. Yet we complain about the process. Uh, I can fly from here to Texas pretty much takes a whole day, but when you consider the amount of distance I ta it takes instead of weeks on a plane and then maybe a car or whatever to get there, I'd say overall it's worth it, but yet people still complain about flying. Uh, they complain about the toilet seats being left up. They complain about other people's Facebook statuses. They complain about typos and grammatical errors. I will admit I'm guilty of the grammatical errors, but uh, complaining about them. But if you read any of my posts, I probably am full of typos. Uh, they complain about people who like them too much. Uh, they complain about Mondays. Uh, one guy comments, come on. Unless, uh, unless you've raged all Sunday, you're probably the most refreshed on Monday morning. I'm going to add to that, unless you're a pastor or raged all Sunday, you're probably the freshest on Monday. Having grown up with a pastor, I will tell you, 
pastors aren't the freshest on Monday. Uh, it's the day after their most stressful day. Uh, spoilers online or the other complaints that I hear about spoilers in the office now that everybody watches things on Hulu or Netflix. Waking up in the morning, I will admit I'm guilty of complaining of that, but as one guy points out on the internet, come on guys, you're complaining about the fact that you exist another day. And one of the things that we've learned with COVID is lots of times we complain about the fact that we had to get up and to go about our daily routine, which could have had something catastrophic happen, like COVID, and change our entire daily, entire daily routine. But yet we complain about it. We complain about things like Nickelback, Justin Bieber, Twilight, Miley Cyrus, etc. Uh, probably a lot of com- to complain about there. But if we think about this, we complain about the f- entertainment that's available to us. Uh, we, people complain about hangovers. I don't. Uh, I don't get them. Uh, as one guy pointed out on the internet, okay, you complain about your first hangover, but guys, can hangovers are completely preventable. Why are you complaining about them? Uh, we complain about handling things that we're supposed to. You know, I've got this big project at work I'm going to have to work on. Yeah, that's why they pay you. And then, number 16, we complain about people who complain. Uh, Like I'm doing right now, uh, complaining about all of these things, and yet I I do complain. But in America, these are the things that we complain about. And I've also kind of added a few other things that I've read about. I've read about people who are so upset that they have to seek treatment. They have to go to a therapist because they don't have enough money to buy the latest iPhone or because their house isn't as big as their friend's house or because their parents aren't as wealthy as they wish they were. Now, the iPhone complaint. People are upset and I, and I get people go to therapists for legitimate reasons, uh, trauma and so forth. And so I'm not, I'm not disparaging everyone who goes to therapists or needs to go to therapy. And if you need help, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want, you can start by reaching out to us here at the church. And uh, we can help you with some counseling. And if you need more therapy, we can let you know that. But to consider that you become so depressed over not being able to afford the latest iPhone. I looked it up. The latest iPhone the most expensive latest iPhone is $1,100. That is 22 days worth of work for the average person on that bubble between uh, upper middle class and rich around the world. Or a high income, sorry. 22 days worth of their pay and yet we complain if we can't afford that luxury. Uh, when I went, uh, had the opportunity as a, as a younger man to do some traveling abroad, I was stationed in Germany. I got to go to uh, take trips to Russia and to uh, Kenya. And one of the things that blew me away was I would go to these countries where they're not nearly as well off. And the people were happier. In Russia, Russia, if you have ever studied Russian history, and if you need a sad sob, sob story, I encourage you to study Russian history. Russia has been oppressed since forever. Like literally since they became a country, their own government has been oppressing them. And yet, when I was there, the people were happy, the people were friendly. And when I come here, where we have freedom and we have blessings coming out of our ears, the people complain about waking up. And they complain about Mondays. And the complaining becomes frustrating. Uh, You're probably wondering where I'm going with all of this. I do have a message uh, from the scripture about it. But I wanted to set a background so that we can understand where, at least as a culture, if not us individually, sit in recognizing what God has given us and what he is doing in our lives. 
So if you would, turn to Genesis chapter 29. We're going to start there. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 29 and Genesis 30. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 29, starting in verse 31. And while you're flipping there, I will let you know, the last time I preached on Sunday mornings, uh, I talked about the name, the, the importance of the name change when Adam changed Eve's name and, and what that meant to us in the picture of grace there. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, Rachel and Leah, and to understand what's going on in the story, you have to understand the names there. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about the names uh, there in this passage. I didn't intend for this to be a mini-series, but I suppose you could put them together, and it's John talking about names in the Bible. But either way, whether you look at this as standalone or comparing, that is, that is where we see a lot of the value here. So if you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 29, verses 31 and following, and I will read, uh, I'm not going to read it all right now, I'm going to read it in pieces as we look at it. Real quick, though, before I read, quick background bef to what we're reading. Jacob, twin brother with Esau, cheats his brother Esau. He tricks, tricks his father Isaac, cheats his brother Esau. Esau wants to kill him. He flees. He runs away. He goes to Laban's house. He gets to Laban's house. Uh, he sees Laban's daughter. Rachel decides he wants to marry her. Says, hey, I want to marry Rachel. Uh, Laban Tricks the trickster, says, tell you what, you work seven years for, I'll let you marry her. Uh, he agrees to it. He works his seven years. They have a big wedding day, and instead of Rachel, Laban gives him her older sister, Leah. Uh, Jacob's like, hey, man, uh, this was not the deal. And he says, yeah, well, she was older, needed to marry her off first, but if you'll agree to another seven years, I'll give you Rachel too. Now we have Jacob with two wives and we, it sets the background for this. Jacob obviously prefers Rachel over Leah and we see in verse 31 how this unfolds. And when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived a son and called his name Reuben, for she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name is called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. So here we have Leah. She opens the story. It says... Uh, when God saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her, room, her womb, but Rachel was barren. Remember, Rachel is loved, and Leah was unloved, but Leah has the children, and Rachel has none. What's important to understand there is that in their society, a woman's ability to be considered successful, to be considered fulfilled, was her ability to produce children, in particular male children, for the family. Leah starts off right out the gate here. We see that she has four boys. And the first three boys, she names them expressing her plea, her desire for her husband's love. Now by the society at the time, looking at Leah, she is successful. She has everything that the average woman wants. But she wants the affection of her husband. She wants the attention of her husband. That he's denying her and giving it all to her sister. The names of her son, uh, of her sons in verse uh, 32, 
Reuben literally see a son. She's like, hey, I have a son. Pay attention to me. Uh, Simeon, in verse 33, is literally heard because she's saying God had heard that I was unloved. And in verse 34, Levi is attached because, again, she's wanting her husband to become attached to her. But then comes son number four, Judah, or literally praise. Now, this, the first three names focus on her desire that she's not having fulfilled, her desire to have her husband's attention and her husband's affection. But then her fourth son, the names switch, the, the focus of Leah switches to recognizing God's provision and praising God for his prevention. Her naming there shows now she has shifted from Jacob to God as her primary source that she's looking to for fulfillment and, and love. Now one commentator suggested that maybe she understood that Judah would be the line of the Messiah, the line of uh, David. There is a uh, reason to believe that. We can look in the, uh, towards the end of Genesis and we see that uh, Jacob, when he's blessing his children, says that Judah will be the one where there are kings coming from. And ultimately, the king of kings is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Maybe she understood that. Maybe she understood that through the line of Judah was coming the blessing that God had promised to Adam and Eve and to Abraham before. Or maybe she just recognized finally that God was the only source that she had that would be reliable on, that she could rely on. Either way, we can see now Leah shifting and putting her faith in God. Her faith in Him and taking her, her joy from His work. How about us? Are we able to see that in spite of the fact that there's the one thing that we're missing... That we, that we want, that we think will make us happy. Maybe our problem is that we're looking in the wrong place for our fulfillment. Are we able to see that God is the source of our joy and fulfillment and not the supposed blessings that we're seeking? Uh, now we'll move on. Uh, we'll come back and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but we're going to move on and we're going to take a look at Rachel. Rachel. Now, Rachel, on the other hand, of course, she's barren. She doesn't have any children. The women in the, neighbor, in, the, in the community are saying that she's a failure, yet she has everything her sister Leah wants. She has the attention and affection of her husband. But th is that enough for Leah that she has the attention and affection of her husband? We'll s we start in chapter 30, verse 1, and we will see what happens with, with Rachel. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel uh, envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, here is my maid, Bilhah, Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave her maid Bilhah to, uh, as a wife to Jacob, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestling I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. 
So we see Rachel, she's upset. She's saying, I want this blessing. I want what my sister has. I want that over there. She becomes very jealous and she becomes angry. And she's demanding it from her husband who rightly points out, he's not God. He doesn't have control over this. So she takes matters into her own hands and she decides, now this, a, a lot of women would think this is kind of weird sounding that uh, she would take her maid and have her husband uh, sleep with her maid in order to have children. But at the time, this was an acceptable thing. So she gives her, her maid to her husband as another wife, a uh, wife, concubine. She was of lower status, even though she was still a wife. Uh, but because of that, Rachel was able to have some claim on the children, on, on the offspring. So she does this, uh, and she thinks this has fixed the problem. Jacob is having children now with her maidservant. And so she says, see, God has judged between us. And so she names the first one Dan, or literally judge. Uh, then the second one who's born, again, to her maidservant, not to her. Uh, she, la she names literally wrestling because she says, I've been wrestling with my sister and I've won. Because she's sitting there thinking, okay, I can't have children, but now I have two children and I have my husband's affection. I've, I've won. How often do we do the same kind of thing that Rachel is doing? We say, this is what I want. This is what I think will bring me happiness. And we push the issue. And when we think we have success at reaching what we want, we say, see, that's all God wanted me to do. We try to justify it like Rachel has done here. But she's forced the issue. She's gone outside of God's will, outside of God's design for marriage to try to push uh, the issue to get what she thinks will make her fulfilled and happy. And we often do this, uh, and from a short time, it may even appear to make us happy, but it ultimately will fail to bring us joy. And the difference there is stark. Uh, we was watching a children's program with our kids this week, and they were explaining the difference between joy and happy. And he said, a, a cookie will make you happy. Uh, you will be happy for a few seconds if you eat a cookie. But joy is, la joy lasts forever. Now, I like cookies, but I understand that we can't look to cookies for fulfillment and for joy because it only lasts a few seconds. Of course, that just means you need to eat more cookies. Just kidding. My uh, imaginary audience is laughing. When Leah, so we'll move on to, to verse 9, and we'll see what happens after Rachel has given her handmaid. So it says, when, uh, verse 9 says, When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. Then Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, A troop comes. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore again, and uh, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Now the two names there are literally uh, Don't give me a second, I lost my place. Oh, the two names there are l literally the idea of fortune, the troop comes, there's a good fortune, um, and then for Asher is happy. And so here she is, here's Leah. Now the last time we saw Leah, she was trusting in God and resting in God's provision for her. But now her sister has gone out and forced the issue with her maid. And Leah's like, oh, no, 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 you don't. I may not be having kids anymore, but I have a maid. And so she plays the same game. She has two children by her maid. And we notice that these two children are the first of all of the children so far whose names don't reflect some, uh, some at least, acknowledgement of God's involvement. I have a troop. 
hey, I have a large number, and I am happy. You see, in spite of the fact that she already understood what it took to have true joy and true fulfillment, we see Leah stepping back. We see Leah moving back and, and responding to her sister in kind of a jealous tit-for-tat move. And she has her two children, which she thinks will solve the problem again. She calls Asher happy. And we just talked about the difference between happy and joy. How often do we do that? How often do we believers regress and step away from trusting in God and His provision and back to trying to force the issue on our own? Well, the story doesn't stop there. Uh, it says, now Reuben went, Reuben, remember, he's the, the eldest of Leah, went uh, out in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you would take away my husband? Would you also take away my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came in from the field that evening, Leah went out and met him and said, You must come in to me, uh, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my ma maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Jacob said, God has endowed me with, good, with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. So... You're probably a little confused if you haven't kept up with your ancient understanding of fertility about what's going on with the mandrakes. Reuben goes out, he finds wild mandrakes, he brings them to his mother because good sons like to bring flowers and fruit and vegetables to their, to their mothers. Mandrakes, though, uh, they believed aided in fertility. So Rachel is sitting there, now envious of her sister's ability to have children, no longer being happy with the fact that her maid had children because, well, so did Leah's maid. And so she sees now Leah has mandrakes, and she says, give me some of your mandrakes. And uh, Leah kind of rebuffs her. Like, hey, you've taken my husband's affection. Now you want to take my, my son's gifts? Like, what's up with you? So she offers a deal. Apparently it was... Uh, her night to uh, have Jacob. So she says, I will give you tonight with Jacob in exchange for your mandrakes. And what L Rachel is hoping for is that by getting the mandrakes, she will become fertile. She's again trying to manipulate, trying to force her will because she wants a child. Leah, on the other hand, makes the trade, makes the agreement, but instead of relying on the mandrakes to make her fertile she prays to God and that is noted when it says that God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son and now we see Leah back to two things back to wanting her husband's approval but also recognizing God's hand in all of it and so she says God has given me my wages uh, and literally, Issachar is wages. And then we see uh, in verse 20, when she names Zebulun, the idea is dwelling. My husband will dwell with me because I have six children. Now, one commentator I read suggested that after six children, she did finally get some, not all of, but some attention from her husband who couldn't ignore the fact that she had borne six boys and then later bears a daughter. Uh, it could be that, or it could just be a recognition that she's still desiring 
his attention, still desiring his affection. But we see her now recognizing God's work in her life again. Now, after observing all of this, Rachel, Rachel has tried everything in the book. She's given her maid to her husband. It seemed to work, but not really. They weren't really her kids. Now she's taken the mandrakes. That didn't help. She's still not bearing. And so finally, it says God remembered, in ver- starting in verse 22, it says, and God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Finally, she's asking God. Demanding from her husband didn't work. Giving the maids didn't work. Trying the, the supposed medical treatment didn't work. Now we see Rachel humbled and going to God. And God listening to her. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And we see a completely different look on Rachel than we've seen previously in the passage. Previously we've seen the arrogance and the anger and the frustration. And now we see trusting in God. She's prayed to God. She has another son and she names him and and gives him a name that shows that she has faith that God will continue to bless her. That God will give her another son. Where are, where are you on this? Are we, where are you, where am I? Are we trying everything within our power for what we think will bring us fulfillment or are we leaning on God? Are we trusting in Him? Uh, the story the, the story of course goes on uh, says uh, the story of course goes on and we know later on that Rachel does bear uh, another child uh, she dies in childbirth though during that time frame but we can see that instead of trusting only in Themselves, there was a move to trust in God. How have we been responding? We in America, I, I opened this, this morning by talking about how blessed we are here in America. In the eyes of the world, we have everything. We have freedom. We have prosperity. We have opportunity. As a nation, we have these things. But yet we complain. We want more. We complain about what we have. We fail to see God's work in our lives, and we fail to respond, and we fail to trust Him. We try to fill, as there's there's an old picture that says, You know, each one of us has a God-sized hole in our heart and we try to fill that with stuff. We saw Leah, she had a, a hole in her heart that she thought that her husband's affection would fill and she tried to fill it. She had child after child after child and she was unable to fill it until she recognized that God was her source of joy, her source of fulfillment. We see Rachel, she had the love of her husband but she still had that, that hole and she wanted to fill it with children and she tried everything she could. She gave her handmaid to her husband to have children for her as a surrogate mother. She tried the uh, treatments, as you might say, with the mandrakes and yet it was not able to be filled. Her fulfillment, fulfillment was only available in God. Where are you on this story? Have you not recognized yet your need for God? 
through Ju- Judah, through the line that he came, there was, of course, King David and, of course, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Through him, salvation is available to all of us. Fulfillment is available to all of us. Filling that hole is available to all of us. If you have not found that fulfillment, if you have not found uh, Jesus, if you, if you do not understand what I'm talking about, I would encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, you can email any of us pastors. Uh, I'm Pastor John, John at mbaptist.org. You can also e- email Pastor Dennis or Pastor Caleb. You can email any of us. You, uh, reach out to us on Facebook. Call us. Or open the scriptures and read. If you go to John chapter 3, Christ explains how he is there for you. But even for those of us who are believers, where are we at? Are we stepping back the way Leah did? Are we failing to recognize God's continued work in our life because we don't see the blessings that we want to see, that we think we ought to see? You see, Rachel's fulfillment was available to her in God. Not in children, not in uh, having children and competing with her sister. It was available to her in God. Likewise, Leah's fulfillment was available to her in God. Not in her husband's affection, but in God. And Leah recognized that at one point, but then went back into the old trap. I I challenge you, you believers, where are you looking right now to see fulfillment? Are you recognizing that no matter what happens in your life, whether you live or whether you die, whether you have prosperity or whether you have want, that ultimately we can rest in the fulfillment and the salvation of, that comes through Christ. We can be content. True contentment can be found only when we recognize that. That our life, our fulfillment comes through Christ. Our affection that we seek can only be filled in Christ. And I would encourage you to, if you're a believer, to look at getting back to your first love. Walk closer with God. Spend time with Him. Right now, especially, your life is slower than it has been in a long time, probably. There's less work. There's less events. Take that time and invest it. Spend time in Scripture. Spend time in prayer. Invest it in your relationship with God because only there will you find true contentment. Only there can we find the answer to all of our complaints. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, but most of all, we thank you for your, your gift of eternal life and your gift of a relationship with us. Lord, we are sinful and we do not deserve this, but you've given it to us anyway. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to recognize in our lives, instead of being uh, frustrated for the things we don't have, to thank you for the things that we do have and to seek our fulfillment, our joy, in our relationship with you. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.